Jonathan Harker's Journal, October 31st, 1888. The relentless rain continues, threatening to wash out the narrow road, and still the coach trundles on, lurching in the ruts and nearly pitching me from my seat in the damp and chilly compartment. I had passed a nervous night, dining with our host and others who had converged at this small hotel, high in the Carpathians, as though jointly driven there by an unknown malefic force. The small dining area was occupied by an army surgeon by the name of Esdale and three Spangler iron merchants from the Harappan River Valley who glanced furtively at me and spoke brilliantly to each other in hoarse whispers. Supper consisted of soft cheese and the local speciality, chicken paprikash, which was very thirsty, and we slaked our dry throats with the local tokai, an unusual blood-red wine with heady effects that were not unlike absinthe. And once I retired upstairs, I spent some quality time on the bed, vigorously beating off the hordes of ants that had emerged from the casters of the chair in the corner. My mattress was soft, but the bedding itself was harsh. There were no blankets, and the sheets were nothing more than heavy brown paper, wired together and dipped in vinegar. I fell into a drunken stupor, and my dreams were not pleasant, but redolent with horrific women resembling undines and sylphs with deep staring hypnotic eyes and gaping red mouths. I awoke exhausted, and after breakfasting on the local bread and cabbage with a mug of tea, I boarded the conveyance that had been sent for me and left at first light. That was many restless and uncomfortable hours ago. Now night is falling, and we're alone on the Borgo Pass. The coachman up top ignores me completely. I sit writing in pencil on the back of my solicitor's case, mostly by touch, since the only light issues from the storm's frequent flashes. The pair of horses is nervous, and the black coach, replete with supplies, churns over, ever upward, toward the gathering blackness. And all the while, the rain continues to fall, tumbling in rivulets down the cliffs into the hollows of the deep Transylvanian gorge below us. Occasionally, a blast of lightning strikes perilously close, illuminating the crags and pine forests, revealing wolves and other things I cannot bear to think of. I only hope the storm ends soon, and that the portcullis of the Count's castle has been raised and that there's a welcoming roaring fire in the great hall. I'm cold and hungry and unsettled, and I so need human company. Hey man, you're freaking me out, that vampire story, Scroll. I agreed to be your resident people's physicist for 20 bucks a show, but I never signed up for the undead, man. You're scaring the shiz jig out of me. I'm handing things over to Chris Thompson to bring us back home to Canada. This dude's supper's gonna be steaks and garlic. Kilt Pazixum! Welcome, fellow storm riders and travelers in the dark. Your unconscious mind has inexorably brought you here, and there's a pleasant cauldron of wolf's bane and tallow simmering in the kitchen just for you. We're hypnotists! We're not vampires! <laughs> this is Brain Software number 99, and you are officially a permanent rider on the hypnotic storm. Mm. It's a storm that remembers Bram Stoker. Uh. It's a storm that often thinks of Spunky and Beezer, uh. and it remembers Colonel Mustard's restaurant in Port Perry, <laughs> and most of all, even though its effects have been felt in Alcatraz and Dartmoor and Angola State Penitentiary, <laughs> it's a storm that never has a criminal mind. Never! But more about that later. Mm. Please welcome to the hypnotic world epicenter, the world's foremost pluviophile. That's me. The very membrane of transic states uh -oh. and the Abraham Van Helsing of hypnosis, our fearless leader, Mike Mandel. Yes, from way across the room, Chris. What a show we got today. It's it, a good day. It's, it's going to be a good day. one. It's a warm day. <laughs> it's a warm day. And um, I've heard it described. We are recording, I think it is April the 19th as oh, we're recording man. this. It is. Which means we're quickly approaching your birthday. Oh, yeah. But more days. importantly, it's not really April the 19th. It's more like January the 107th. Uh. 
Because hey, hey, no, it's the April 17th today. 17th. Oh, there you go. Well, That's whatever. not rush things. It still feels like it's January where we are. We yeah. just had an insane winter ice and snowstorm. As I plunge towards seniorhood. But soon it will be May. And yeah. in May yes. comes the return of our presence at the University of Toronto St. Michael's College, mm-hmm. where we will be teaching the architecture of hypnosis coming up soon. We're also bringing in Melissa Tears right. coming up very soon. I want to give you guys a heads up that class is just about filled up as is the mindscaping class on may 4th the day preceding the melissa tears addictions protocol class and then our architecture of hypnosis season begins in mid may followed by the june edition there are only four spots left in the june class right now so unbelievable uh, people who don't sign up for it are gonna have to wait until november for our next class the following year and so on anyway today's podcast before we get into all that stuff today is an amazing podcast. We're going to be talking about what are we talking about here? Well, Mike? we got a, we got a sort of a smorgasbord. We're going to talk about guilt and shame, the right. differences, what it means to be labeled, and how to deal with labels appropriately. We're going to look at uh, cool our, things you can do to annoy your friends and family. There's yes. a few of those. We have another word of the day, which another I won't word of the day. I won't mention yet. No. Well, we should actually diverge that now because all right, let's divulge. Do it. I said diverge. diverge. Oh, I'm losing diverge. my mind, Chris. I said right. the wrong word. Well, let's converge back on <laughs> the topic. All right. Again. So, um, hang on. I'm just going to no, do that. don't. Do it! Don't do it! Oh, it don't gonna, do it! It's gonna cough. Oh, At least it didn't do it on your neck. Your, it's like you save up your cough for the know, podcast. Well, you cough never all cough, all cough at jujitsu class. No, never, no, I don't. You never cough <laughs> when we're hanging out at lunch. But whenever we do a podcast, it's like it's anchored. Are, <laughs> yeah. Do you have an it. itchy head right now? <laughs> Shut up! All right. So the word for today, and I picked this purely at random. I opened um, a Frank Edwards book, and the word for today is. Physician. All right. So how are we applying physician to today? Okay, well, that's a really good one. So if we think about... Well, they're all really good ones, right? It's the application. Well, it's just random words, right? You open a book, you pick a word. Physician. So a physician you can think of as your primary caregiver or Ah. care... Caregiver is not really the right word, but um, somebody who is your consultant when it comes to your health and your wellness. Okay. So... Perhaps you can use your own brain as your physician and decide what are you going to do with the information that you learn today, tomorrow, whatever, to make your life better in right. some way. Right, and apply it to mental health. And also physicians have very specialized knowledge after, what, mm-hmm. six to eight years of university. So what specialized areas of knowledge can you continue to develop for the next six to eight years Good that one. will improve your life? So many ways to apply that as a metaphor for your life. And what kind of surgery can you do on yourself? That's right. Yeah, what kind of surgery? <laughs> okay, that's... That's, a, that's the... the we'll leave, Say that for 100. So um, let's talk about guilt and shame. I know this has come up a a, a number of times lately, and this is very, very uh, interesting to me because um, I know it's very important that we recognize the difference because the way people respond to these two things um, can be the same, but they are not the same thing at all. Let's let's get the clarification. Yeah. So not only are they not the same, but I would... I would argue that the way people respond is significantly different insofar as how quickly they can get over the feelings. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's dive right into it. People often, in my experience, Chris, never get over shame. Often. Yeah. Yeah, Because if they take it on, which we're going to get to now as this part of the discussion happens, when they take on something at the level of identity, it's very difficult to overcome right. unless you change your identity. So, right? yes. So let, okay, let's, let's get talk, into What it. is the difference between so guilt this, and shame? This came up yesterday because we were discussing it while planning the podcast, which is why we decided to throw this in here. And the key difference between guilt and shame is that guilt is something that has to do strictly with your behavior. So let's say, and this came up in a book that I've been listening, an audio book that I've been listening to recently. Let's say that you are the type of person that constantly goes out and parties really hard at night, drinks a lot of alcohol, and then shows up for work a little bit late, feeling like crap, performing like crap, and that can result in either guilt or shame. If it results in guilt, it's usually guilt such as, oh, I feel guilty because I've been drinking too much and not doing a good job. It wasn't the way I wanted to be. I am going to lose my job. I I could get fired. The boss is going to get pissed off at me, whatever it is, right? Right. It, uh, guilt could also be the same thing in a family situation. I feel guilty because, uh, well, actually, let's just look at this last weekend. I had to take my kids to a dance competition. And because there was a lot of prep work going on, I didn't right. need to be hanging around. So I went out and did some errands. And I just barely, Mike, barely made it back to and watch their unusual their thing. Their tap and your dance two routine. lovely daughters, uh, Velocet and Drencron. I'm making a point here, though. I'm Thank just you. saying yeah. they, it would be vitally important for them to have you there. Think So think about it. I literally... 
walked into the um, what do you call it theater right as they were starting. Uh, if I had been, did they see you? Yeah. Well, I no, they don't normally see me in the audience. It's too dark. Okay, so you didn't enter waving, regardless, or shouting. Let me get back to my point. No, this is <laughs> so, important. No, this no, is no. Important. Go if ahead. I had been two minutes late. I would have missed their entire performance. Guess I would have felt very guilty. I would not have felt shame. I would have felt guilty, guilty. because of my behavior. Because, well, it wasn't even something I could It's a control. passive behavior, really, in this case. In this case. Yeah. But, I, but I would have felt guilt, and I would have gotten over it pretty quickly. Yeah. Now, shame is at the level of identity. Shame would be, let's say, well, let's go back to the, I drank too much, and I'm constantly showing up for work late right. and performing crappy. I'm a horrible person. I can't be relied upon. I am, I am a, I'm a drunk. I'm a, whatever it is. Right. Okay. And Glad or, to hear you finally confess or, all this and record it. Or <laughs> let's say in the, in the real situation of me showing up uh, for my kids. Right. Let's imagine I'm I had missed it. I'm a bad father. Yeah. yeah. I'm a, I'm a horrible father. Yeah. I am not doing a good job. My kids are, are going to see me as weak and uh, uncaring or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Soft. So, softer on the edges. Okay. So that is a hugely different phenomena when I am taking something on at the level of I identity, I am experiencing shame. I am not good enough. But buddy, you don't, you don't do that though. No, you understand this no stuff. Yeah. I don't. Of and course so not. The, the clarification here, and I just want to, again, want to point out how freaking hilarious it was. I had no idea I was going to say Veloset and Drenkron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those of you who are Clockwork Orange fans will recognize this extremely obscure. Anyway, um, sorry, I'm just applauding my own brilliance for a moment here. The, um, all right, okay, Mike, now Mike the, have you ever experienced shame? No, not shame. Or but, guilt, But guilt, obviously. most definitely, yes. But again, I guess the clarification is guilt is we, we feel bad about something we have done or not done. Could be passive. It could be something we fail to do. Yeah. Guilt is behavioral and shame is identity. It's there's something wrong with me. Guilt is I did something wrong. Shame is there's something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. And it's much deeper because uh, it's a logical level of identity, isn't it? Absolutely. And so Dilt's Logical Levels comes into play here and we'll link to it in the show notes. Remind me. To Good. OK, I shall. Here. Because that is, is such an important model. It keeps coming up over and over that when you change something at the level of identity, it automatically can affect the behavior below it. And if you only change the behavior, you're not necessarily changing your identity. Right. right. I find it immensely useful. I had a discussion with John Grinder, co-founder of NLP, about this many years ago. And he said it isn't he said the logical levels, he said it doesn't even make sense. He disagrees with it because he said when you have a hierarchy like that, everything higher up in the hierarchy has to take in everything else below. And he said these are completely different categories. Okay. But I understand he's looking at it as a linguist from his perspective sure. and as the co-founder of NLP. But I'm looking at it using John Grinder's own criteria a as model. whether it's a model that is useful. So yes, Robert it is a useful found a very model. useful model. Let's go through them really quickly. So this is right. your environment. Okay, so it, at your environment, you have things like the people around you. Maybe it's the weather, if you want to be specific about it. You know, I could say, well, the, the weather never cooperates and it's always against me. Right, and these right. snowstorms so like always screw fact. up. I got fired because of this <laughs> stupid weather. I couldn't get to work. Whatever it is, right? <laughs> you just think you're blaming the environment. Yeah, you're, bl- you're, oh, at, you're at the these effect people, rather than at cost. These people that I have to hang around at work never support me, and that's the reason. Yeah, all right, I think you, you know, made the point with that yeah. horrible voice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna have a, like, we got to give you, that you one a name. Me. You interrupt yeah. me, but you do this. Like, you do this for like 10 minutes. Well, why are you always complaining, <laughs> Mike, about my, I always so have to do this people, podcast with you, and you're just <laughs> Shut up before one of us dies. Now, listen. So here we have the uh, environment. So your people who are at environment... Um, they tend to respond as though life is happening to them, yeah, that they yeah. have no choice, right? Yeah. So above that, we have behavior. Exactly. So once we and create some, or once we have exhibiting, once we start again, eh, eh. once we exhibit new behaviors, our environment's going to change automatically. So let's say uh, you have, you're a jerk at work. And your behavior is you're just irritated all the time and yelling at people and melting off. And because of your position, you can get away with it. Your environment's going to be very uncomfortable. Other people are going to be unhappy. It's going to be tension. But if you change your own behavior and start treating people with dignity and kindness and so on, right Somehow away, the environment, the environment will miraculously change. change. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But what do we need in order to exhibit new behavior? Well, you need skills of some sort. Right. So you need, um, yeah, third level up. What's it called? Capabilities. Capabilities. Which is Thank another you. word yeah. for ability. Yeah, I was thinking capabilities 
use resources. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. You need capabilities. Now I, I, let's come back to the weather metaphor again here. Okay. Too, just yeah. Because yeah. it does work it's so a well. Good one. And I remember my wife was telling me yesterday morning something about a, a neighbor who came over to help her shovel later on in the day. Couldn't make it into work because of this snowstorm and the driveway was completely slicked over with ice and snow and it was just all really nasty. And yeah. apparently she'd just taken a photo and sent it into work saying, oh, I can't make it to work today. Now, okay. that's <laughs> fine in certain that's situations. Um, but here's the thing. So your environment is, okay, totally there's, there's, horrible, the there's horrible there's <laughs> horrible weather, right? Your behavior is, in this case, to say, well... <laughs> It's really crappy out and I don't need to go in because, you know, look at all this snow. So your behavior is to just accept your environment and, and ah, that's play nice. the role that's of victim. Well, if you had the capabilities right. to shovel, you could suddenly find, hey, well, the roads are clear. It's just my driveway that's nice. holding me yeah, in. Yeah. I can move this freaking snow in about 20 minutes of hard labor. Right. And all of a sudden, I'm going to experience a totally different environment, which is... The roads I'm driving on now are actually fine. You're right. So you've shifted to a different environment by adopting your behaviors. Now, of course, if you move above capabilities, we have beliefs. And if someone believes, I can't shovel snow mm-hmm. because I might have a heart attack. You yeah. Know, so. Or I'm entitled to stay home today. Oh, that's you know, an interesting That's another one. belief, yeah, yeah. right? So all of these things are going to have an effect. And above, above this, we're now getting to identity. Right. And identity is, these are the I am statements, the ego, ami in the Greek. It's the who am I statements. I am a hypnotist. I am whatever. Yeah. Uh, and above that is mission or spiritual, which is the one NLP does not touch. Oh, and you know what? Just following my metaphor with this weather thing. You still there? So you've got, okay, identity is the word just. Sometimes, well, I'm just an employee. Wow, that's limiting, and isn't so it? So think about it. Yeah, I'm yeah. just an employee and I'm entitled to stay home today and I don't really have the strength today to shovel. Therefore, this weather is holding me back and I'm just going to stay home. Oh, wow. But if you take on the identity of I'm a problem I'm a responsible solver, person, I'm, yeah. I am a freaking leader in my community yeah. or whatever it is. Then you're onward. All of a sudden, oh, I can shovel. Yeah, yeah. I can get out of the truck. I can get into work, whatever it is. And so I'm not well, saying that anyone should go around driving in this kind of well, shite no, no, weather. I'm not, I'm not saying we should go rub yeah. banks, Chris. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying that we should just uh, just giving you guys examples. <laughs> I know. Here. I just had to say what yeah, I was saying. <laughs> so let's let's go back here. You're so no, such a criminal. Let's try. I have no, <laughs> no criminal mind. I do not That's <laughs> at all. Now let's apply this to guilt and shame. So guilt is something you have done. It's only at the level of behavior. That's it. So how? Yeah, we need to talk about how to take people who are dealing with shame and translate that into guilt that they can move past, they can leave behind. Right. Well, you know what? One of the things I think is remarkable is the tapping that we teach in our all our classes, and I've taught this uh, all over the U.S. as well, the nine gamut, the tapping on the back of the hand for the installation of a powerful ego state. I think you can, can put some really good I am statements in when you're tapping that point between the baby finger and the ring finger on the back of the hand with the channel where the two fingertips just fit, tapping there and making the the strong I am statements, I'm a responsible person, I'm smart, I'm empowered, I'm feeling awesome. This kind of thing instead is a great antidote. But when people have shame, a lot of the time, Chris, um, you'll see this with people who've been scapegoated. And it's a very, very sad thing. As you know, I've been dealing with a woman who went through profound scapegoating from yes. her family, her entire life. Chris is well familiar with this. And those of you out there who have become scapegoats over the years, you've got to recognize uh, we believe the only solution is to go no connection. You have to escape from these people because a scapegoat has been uh, someone who has shame put upon them from the outside. It's not theirs to own. They become the family garbage can. Oh, and you mean like a, a whole bunch of people that, yes. that the scapegoat is hanging around get dumped Usually on, family. And it all has to do... Now, they and still it has have to, to do with identity stuff. Well, then they still have to accept the shame at some level. Well, they the are problem is it's coming from family it. a lot of the time and people right, they, right, that right. they care about and they start taking this stuff on as personal responsibility. So it's and stickier in that sense. Brilliant, Chris. That's a perfect way to put it. Recognize scapegoat goating you are a garbage can for the family if you are a scapegoat they are projecting onto you the crap about themselves that they cannot face Mm -hmm. so the only way they can attack it is to project it onto someone else and then attack it i'm glad you're bringing this up because it does make sense that you can shame yourself 
or you other can, you can, can accept and hold on to shame that other people bring into the mix. So, for right. example, let's say the, the book that I was listening to had a lot of examples about women being moms and let's say a kid doing something and another mom saying, oh, I, I can't believe you let your kid get away with that or something like that, let's yeah. say. And, and I'm not going to make a specific example out of it, but... If somebody says that to you, oh, I can't believe that you let your kid do X, Y, Z, whatever, all of a sudden the implication is, yeah. I'm a bad mom. Right. I'm a bad parent. I'm a bad person. I feel now there's this deep shame, especially if it comes from someone who you think of as a close friend. They say this to you and they don't mean to hurt your feelings or shame you, but that's what they're doing. For it sure, is really for sure. important to be aware of when you catch yourself saying something that could shame another person to have them think, oh, they're not good enough, or to recognize when it's being done to you. Recognize because you do not have done. to accept it. No, definitely you do not. Recognition is the first part of this. And this this whole thing of labeling, you know, when we take on a label, whether it's the label of a specific illness or a disorder of some kind, we take on a limiting label, we will tend to live the labels that we wear. Mm -hmm. You're pretty smart, Mike. Thanks, buddy. That's a yeah, comment, 162. Yeah. <laughs> now listen, uh, well, last time I checked, it's How's probably being shrink. It's doing great. <laughs> It's a great label. So, um, but I'll give you an example. The, the whole thing about self-esteem with kids. Mm. And, and Oh, this is so huge for kids. This, I was going to talk to you about this because you put out your parenting stuff and you know more about it than anybody I know. And um, I, I'm great at parenting cats and bull terriers, but not much else. But um, it's, it's an interesting thing. And I had a discussion a little while ago with someone and he talked about the importance of building kids' self-worth, self-esteem, totally agree. And I said, when I was doing the forensic graphology lectures, are you dating a psychopath throughout the uh, university and college circuit? I did about 20 of them. And universally, I'd, I'd look at 60 to 100 kids' handwriting afterwards. And the, the low self-esteem I was seeing over and over and over, it was the most common trait, really low T-bars. Self-esteem is really important, but that leads to this other thing. I think... It's more important than instead of having a positive self-image, and I still believe self-esteem is important, it's important to have an accurate self-image. You know, I, people will whitewash being a complete jerk because they got a great, you know, self-image. And I hate to use the Hitler example. We're, we're back to the reductio ad Hitlerium, Hitlerum yeah. but Hitlerum. But um, it's true. Hitler had great self-esteem. He really did. But the horror that he brought upon Europe and well, much of the a, world. Yeah, pretty much all leaders have good self-esteem. Well, that doesn't mean but that it's, it's good not, for society. Right. It's not moral. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's way more important to um, have an accurate self-image than a positive self-image. Because if I'm a bank robber, you know, if I was Bugsy Siegel or Al Capone or something, a criminal, and I'm not, I don't have a criminal mind, <laughs> but if I did, um, for me, robbing a bank or, you know, stealing a bunch of diamonds could be a very positive act because it makes yeah, me feel you, good. If you were a criminal, you'd say, oh, yeah, I'm a powerful person and, yeah. and people look up to me because I have power. Because they're terrified. And yeah. you'd do more of it. You'd behave immorally. Right. As a result Al Capone said you get more with a kind word and a gun than you get with a kind word. Yeah. And he was, uh, can you figure his Enneagram type? Uh, eight. Yeah, I think I'm so. Yeah. I think so. So my question for everybody listening is, yeah, I think you should have a good sense of self, a strong sense of self, but you should recognize your own uh, failings and your own darkness. I think we all have to do that. We have to look into the abyss rather than just presenting ourselves as these wonderful, positive people. We have to look at the other sides of ourselves, the shadow, and, and deal with that as well. If we have an accurate self-image, we can then work on the flaws and hopefully become better people. Yeah, Mike, you're making me think of something about myself. Here, Hurrah! Which is, yep, this is an intervention, Chris. Okay, yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, here's the thing. To, to match into what you just said, my sense of my own self-esteem is that I don't freaking quit. I just continue to pursue whatever it is that I'm after. And I'm always thinking about that target state. I can say that so, is true. That is true. So if let's say I failed at something over and over and over and I might be a little bit down about it. Oh, you know, it hasn't worked out yet. But I know internally that I have the ability to continue to keep learning, to keep doing, to improve, and eventually I will get you there. Get, you get, like nobody I know, you get around blockages and you find your way around stuff. You keep at it until the thing yields. And you really have why, great persistence. With self-esteem. So I, have, I don't that. take <laughs> on failures right. at the level of identity. I take them on at the level of behavior. 
Basically, the outcome was not what I wanted. You changed so your behavior. So my behavior didn't work in that situation. But it's right? not affecting who you are. Right. right. Could, and that could be an interpersonal argument between my, let's say myself and my wife. Let's say we get in some big, crazy, screaming match. Oh, again? You know, Scary. guess what? It happens to all of us at some point, oh, right? That's it's right. not a common thing in no. my marriage, but there have been times where we'll oh, get in yeah. some stupid fight, right? <laughs> and if I don't get the outcome that I was after... Because it wasn't whatever, you know, bad arguments are never fun. Right. Well, I'll just realize later, I don't go, oh, I'm a bad husband. I'm a bad person. I don't take it on as an identity. I take it on as I didn't behave well there. I don't let it affect my self-esteem negatively such that, oh, well, I'm just never going to, yeah, you know, I'm not do gonna, anything. Self-esteem, real, that is the, the thing that you need to be like repelling of shame. Right, you, you got to be a strong, rugged individualist yeah. and be ready to push back when yeah. you have to. Yeah, now, by the way. Of course, it, I do have the advantage of here's being another, Here's another thing. What is the opposite of shame? Well, that's it. Do you know what it is? Um, let me think. At least according to Brene that, Brown, the right, author no, of the book. I, I, my wife has read this, but I haven't read the book. But I, I find this very interesting. No, what is the opposite okay. of shame? Empathy. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah it's not yeah. what one would think. It's not what you would think of, but no. once you hear it, but maybe she's you know, wrong. Actually, it makes perfect freaking sense because if you are accepting shame, I am a bad person, blah, blah, blah. If you can be empathetic towards yourself and to other people, you will repel shame. Because there's the acceptance yes. of yourself as an individual. And it's not sympathy. It's not feeling sorry. Oh, I feel so sorry for you that you're dealing with this crap in your life. Then people end up just... That becomes pity. Yeah, and That's exactly. a different thing. Exactly. You, have, you get your martyr mileage, you have yeah. your pity party. But if you no. say to somebody... That must be really difficult what you're going through. Yeah, for sure, man. I, I totally get that. And as a Calvinist Christian, I approach this with the view that everyone carries in Latin the Imago Dei, the image of God. We believe that every human being has intrinsic worth and dignity. Mm -hmm. And that's a great thing to keep in mind. If we treat everyone like they have worth, you're not going to see a lot of shame, are you? Not exactly. Run into so treat people the way you want to be treated. Treat people with empathy. Learn to develop the skill of empathy. Which is in NLP Terms. Right, second, second position, position. which actually fits perfectly with where we want to go next, even though we don't have a whole ton of time left. But we want to make sure you understand the importance of that second position, that understanding what it's like to be in somebody else's shoes. Yeah, take and it if, on. If you can communicate that you understand, even if you haven't been there from personal experience, but you understand that it must be hard or the opposite of that, that must feel really amazing to have accomplished that oh, interesting, whatever, interesting. right? Remember, Chris, the, the Native American um, accent it's, you know, do not judge any man until you've walked two moons in his moccasins. And that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, we don't know what other people have been through. And this is where I differ from Charles Tebbets, the hypnotist, the hypnosis trainer, uh, S&J guy. Uh, interesting. He said, um, Tebbets said that if you had the same DNA as another person and the exact same experiences as them, you'd respond exactly as they did. To which my response was, yes, unless you make different choices. Yes. It's still not determinism. You still have the ability to choose in any situation. Yes, you do. But uh, let's just talk about positive labels and so on quickly here. One of the things that interests me, Chris, is you know this is the case from my life. I started doing hypnosis at 12, became a stage hypnosis um, Stage hypnosis became my career and mentalism in 1975. And um, I took on that, that term. I, I became a hypnotist, a mentalist at the time, and then a hypnotist. And what happened was um, working in all through Southern Ontario, I had the market to myself pretty well. Peter Ravine would sweep through once a year. He didn't play Ontario because of the Ontario Hypnosis Act of 1967, but I was calling it power suggestion at the time and it was fine. But uh, it all fell apart for the, the law. It was ridiculous. Anyway, bottom line is... I had it to myself. I was doing these high schools and colleges and then bars and some corporate things, but it was hard doing them when I was young. And then other hypnotists started to appear on the scene. And a lot of them showed up and cloned my act. almost and they word stole for word. your business? Stole my business. And I, I was stuck. You, I, you must have felt a lot of deep shame. <laughs> I shut up. And <laughs> <you're> <laughs> fast. Of course but, not, right? But, no, of course not. But I started thinking, well, how do I deal with this? And the, the, of course, the initial thought is... Well, drop your prices, undercut them. Yeah, but there were, there was one guy. Would do it just for you said it. You would do he it would just do for a, a hotel show room. just for the hotel room. He didn't. He just had to be on stage. How how can I go in and say I want a thousand bucks? Yeah, it, you know back then. Yeah, if he'll do it for a hotel room. So I, but I said I'm a stage hypnotist. I'm a stage hypnotist. And then one day I read Marilyn Vosavant Brain Building, and you redefined and I yourself. Redefine myself. No, wait a minute. I'm a communicator. And the way you did that is you say. 
Hypnosis. That is an example, example of, of what? what? So I'm chunking up. On it's an example of communication. Chunking up. And what kind of communication? By framing myself as a communicator, all of a sudden I can write. I can do public speaking. I can yeah. do teaching. Well, because you can chunk up and then chunk back down. Chunk what back else down. an example of well, communication? Yes. Well, Teach is teaching. an example of communication. Sure. Um, it made all the difference. And I no longer fought with hypnotists to, to, for the business, but redefined everything I was doing. Guys, be careful what labels you're taking. Right. And at this moment, I just want to say this to you. Ensure that every part of you from the inner parts to those that function on a daily basis and all the ego states that you carry each and every day to interact with others and to deal with the challenges of life are prepared and working together to enable any kind of labeling to fall away if it isn't who you are at your core because the essence of shame is irrelevance to you and the empathy that you feel as you take on new beliefs, new structures, new capabilities, and affect your environment, will protect your identity at such a powerful level that when you install the shifts and changes that I'm implying now and your unconscious fully understands, the depth of the transition will be perfect for you as you find the name and the person behind the name and recognize it's only a label. Do you want to keep it or not? Wide awake now. Awesome. All right. So where are we going next, Mike? Well, I wanted to um, just talk about, I wanted to throw out some of these things that I find really interesting. And one of them I've come up with lately, Chris, is the whole concept of a bucket list and NLP and a bucket list and hypnosis and a bucket list. And what okay, you, tell me like, more. What do you mean by well, this? Well, I'm, I'm an unusual person, Chris. I know that. But what up. do you mean by this? <laughs> I'm a five-year-old. I'm a perpetual five-year-old. I've run my life that way forever and I can't, so nobody can stop me. But the bottom line is, you know, a lot of people have a bucket list, which is the things you want to do before you kick the bucket. And I was trying to think of it the other day. In fact, trying is the word. I was failing on this. I don't have a bucket list. Yeah. I, I honestly have done pretty well everything I've wanted to do in life. I really want to keep doing more of the same. I want to see more opera. I want to drink more great wine. I want to go on more walks with my wife and play with my cat. <laughs> yeah, but shut up. But I also, you know, I want to keep teaching people and I want to get people worldwide to replicate excellence. And as you know, we love it when we get emails from people around the world saying that podcast has transformed my life or the training we did in Toronto or the fact that I'm in MMHA, I want to come to Toronto, but I don't have a list of, you know, I want to ride the Orient Express or, you know, I want to climb to the base camp of Everest or anything like that. What about you? Well, there are lots of things that I want to do in terms of travel, but no, I'm, I feel well, what very. What do you want to do before your impending close yeah. death? <laughs> yeah, I, there's nothing super <laughs> top of my. There's nothing super top of mind that I can think of, Mike. Let me that, just let that go completely. Yeah, I know. Or I just ignore just you. Yeah. No attention. Whatsoever. All right. What else? What, but my point so, is, if if people have one, a list of you know, and they prioritize a list of things they absolutely want to do. You know, one of mine was to see Australia when I was young, and thank God I got to go five times. I love Australia. It's a beautiful place. But I'm just thinking, what kind of intervention could people apply if they, they had something absolutely wanted to do. And here's why I'm mentioning this right now. Uh, my wife's cousin, one of her cousins, passed away yesterday, as you know, from cancer. He was a young man, a really nice guy. Yeah. And I, I liked him a lot. And I felt a deep sorrow for him and his family and still do. Uh, one of the things he did when he discovered he was uh, coming down with this cancer that was spreading through his body was he fulfilled something from his bucket list. He took a bunch of money, took a reverse mortgage on his house, I think, and he went out and bought a brand new black limited edition Corvette. And to him, it was really important. And I think some people would have said, what a waste of money. But this gave him some sense of meaning. Mm -hmm. It was something he wanted to do. So what would you say to people of something? They have one maximum thing they really want to do. How can they apply NLP or hypnosis to make this happen? Well, how how can they apply NLP or hypnosis? I think it's it's just a set of smart questions you can ask yourself. What okay, needs good. what needs to happen in order to unlock this opportunity? Brilliant, brilliant. So what then, needs to happen? Well, I need to take a reverse mortgage so I can get the money. Right. In this case, I need the money. He would have said, "I need, I need the money." Okay. Well, what do you have that's worth anything? I have a house. So how can you yeah, get the money you from your house? Is your piggy right. bank? Yeah, Boom. yeah. And all of a sudden, you've solved the problem, right? Yeah, and I think. Um, 
If people make the compelling image of what they want bigger, brighter, dissociated in front of them, remember, you've got to put yourself in that image. You have to be completely dissociated. See yourself in the image as having this thing. Make it vivid, make it colorful, make it bright and bring it very close to you and spend time looking at it morning and night. It's way better than sticking a picture of a Ferrari on your fridge. Oh, absolutely. And I would say on top of that, it would probably be a good idea to do daily self-hypnosis with in mind, in your unconscious mind, allowing yourself to process ways that you can build the resources that you need, whether it be money, whether right. it be freeing up time, whether it be some skill, whatever it is, spend time doing self-hypnosis to continue to unlock new ideas and then spend actual time with your conscious brain practicing, building, learning, whatever it is. You can't just do self-hypnosis about, let's say you wanted to become an expert marketer and you wanted to be, I'm going through a copywriting training course right Uh now. Let's say I just wanted to be a really good copywriter. I can't just sit there and trance myself out and think about copywriting. I probably should write copy, you know, uh, once in a while in order to get really good at it. Right, Chris. It's not just enough of, you know, thinking about copywriting. You've got to put the time in. Remember I said before about playing guitar and John Grinder agreed. It was the saturation. I saturated my brain listening to blues riffs all day long in the background and then did the physicality as well. What do you need to make it happen? You've got to take the steps, even small ones. And that's why I want to just mention um, the pixel method of self-hypnosis. And I've never shown you this. What's the pixel method? The pixel method is really, really interesting. And um, I won't say the source of this. I, you know, I always credit people, but it's someone who um, is known not for hypnosis, but actually did some time in prison. Uh oh. But the method, Uh-oh. the method, I'm not going to support The criminal method of hypnosis. Oh, shut no. Up. no criminal minds here. I'm not going to support him in, in this, but I'm going to tell you it's not my method, but it's brilliant. Remember when you want to do self-hypnosis, set up in advance and say, I'm going to hypnosis for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, whatever, to improve my um, access to my bucket list or whatever it is. And when I awaken, I will feel either alert and refreshed or tired and ready for bed. So you pre-frame, then here's how you do the induction. Chris, you can try this now. Try it okay, on for size. Okay, or try. And try it on for size. Yeah, as separate ex- separate your hands. When we say try, we, we mean, mean experiment yeah, with, yeah. not fail. Okay, okay separate close your hands. eyes. Okay. And here you imagine, Chris, just look inside your eyelids and you see the tiny microscopic colored pixels there. You notice that? Yeah. So as you're aware of that, put your attention on the first finger of your right hand and it will start to tingle and become cataleptic. And when it does, just acknowledge it to your unconscious. You can either nod or whatever. Now focus on the second finger of your right hand, which will also, as you keep looking at these pixels of light and noticing them, become cataleptic and rigid and numb. <laughs> it's like you just continue. So you go through all the fingers of your right hand, then your thumb, then all the fingers of your left hand and your thumb, and you'll feel your hands become cataleptic and you'll be aware of the pixels. And then your brain will bring you out of trance when it's time. Don't do this if you're driving. Oh, that was freaking cool. Um, is, I just it? want to mention that he while, was doing it. As we yeah, I was. It. I was li- actually doing this, and while I was doing this, re- re-listen to this, folks. When you're somewhere safe, if you're not already, yeah. do it yourself. It's very cool, actually. So I started noticing these little red pixels almost behind my eyelids. Okay, but then as you were suggesting the catalepsy in the individual fingers, and as it was cascading through my yeah. hands the pixels started becoming very bright, white, flashing oh, pixels. Nice. It was freaking cool. Maybe you're cool. having a stroke. Yeah. And remember, <laughs> each one, when you feel the tingling and the catalepsy, the rigidity starting in the finger, then you acknowledge it. Either nod or just yes. internally say yes to your unconscious, and then it will start on the second finger and so yeah. on. And that is your process. I really like that because yeah, it, gives you you so, it gives you something that you have to essentially hallucinate visually. Yes. And then you tie it to the kinesthetic sense of the fingers yeah. and it spreads and it just... It's a very it clever technique. self-amplifies. It does. Now, I'm going to do today's empowering question and as a, a change for everybody listening. All right. So your empowering question today is, which Dracula film was the most terrifying to me? And how can I watch it again and... <laughs> Genius. Okay, do the real empowering question. Okay, so that was not the empowering question. This is today's empowering question for podcast number 99. What are the things I absolutely must experience before I run out of time? And how will I ensure I cause them to happen? What is the most important to me now that that I need to cause 
then to make sure I miss absolutely nothing? And how will I start it happening today? And my empowering metaphor for today, Chris, is the story of David Lang. September 23rd, 1880 was a nice sunny day in Tennessee, and David Lang owned a 40-acre property, most of it in front of his house. He had some draft horses there and a long driveway that led in past a row of trees and fence. He had two children. He had a son, George, who was eight, and he had a daughter, Sarah, who was 11. And they were playing outside with a wooden wagon that he had recently brought them. And as they were playing with it, David's wife was standing on the front steps, watching him walk towards the fence. He was going to go and look at his quarter horses, which he was very proud of. And she said, David, don't be long. He took his large pocket watch out as he reached the fence, turned back and smiled and said, no, I won't. At the same moment, there was a judge arriving, a friend of theirs. His name was August Peck, and he was with his brother-in-law. And as they pulled up near the front of the house, David saw them arriving. And then he disappeared. Judge Peck, his brother-in-law, the two children, and David's wife all panicked, rushed to the spot where he'd been. His wife was screaming. There was no sign of him. There was no hole in the ground. There was nowhere he could possibly be. They were all looking at him, and then he wasn't there. They started ringing the bell outside the house, caused a mass panic. Villagers arrived. He was searched for. They looked for David for hours. The search actually went for two complete weeks. They brought in the county surveyor, who verified that it was pure limestone everywhere, with no gaps, no underwater, underground rivers, and no sudden areas he could have fallen through, no sinkholes. And after months, it was all forgotten. And David's wife sold the property, except the area where he disappeared. She could never bring herself to let go of it. And seven months later, the children were playing where they'd seen him, and they noticed for the first time a 15-foot-wide, perfect circle of stunted yellow grass where he was last standing. His daughter, Sarah, yelled, Daddy! And they heard him answering, calling for help from somewhere, and his voice faded, and David Lang was never seen or heard from again. Thanks, everybody, for listening. This has been Brain Software, episode 99 with Mike Mandel, and I'm Chris Thompson. And coming up next will be episode 100, and it's going to be awesome. So make sure you head on over to our website, MikeMandelHypnosis.com, and especially check out the events page at MikeMandelHypnosis.com forward slash events for all of the upcoming live events. And we'll see you, or you'll hear us, in episode 100. You see, my hands are steady. You see, my face before. So you can take your last look. And they will close the door. I stand accused before you. I have no tears to cry. And you will never break me until the day I die. But a criminal mind is all I've ever known. They tried to reform me, but I made of cold stone. A criminal mind is all all I've ever had. (laughs) Ask one who's known me (laughs) if I'm really so bad. I am. (laughs) 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 Nice one. That's just insane. Gowan Canadian.